All right, we're going to start where we left off in class today, or yesterday, with number 26. What is the molecular geometry of COCl2? So we have to think about the shapes. Bent is going to be one, two, three items. Since we've got four up there, one C, one O, and two CLs, we can't be bent. Next thing we have is tetrahedral. Tetrahedral has a central atom. It has a bond going to a top atom. It has a bond going to a bottom atom, another bottom, and one in the back. It's kind of hard to see, but in 3D, it makes four planes. That's why it's tetrahedral. There's one in the front, one on the side on the right, one on the side on the left, one on the bottom. Okay? So if we look at here, we have to have a central atom and four things around it. That means there has to be a total of five atoms. COCl2 doesn't fit that. Linear means that they're all going to have to be in a line. That's just not going to work either because we've got a carbon that will go in the center. It will bond to the oxygen. And then the CLs, we have to decide where we're going to put those. But I'm going to bet you that a CL doesn't go here and then a CL goes here. It just won't work out if you actually do the whole entire Vesper on it. So we're left with one option, and that is trigonal planar, which happens to be correct, and so I'm glad that works out. Number 27, during the reaction below, methane gas reacts with water vapor to produce carbon monoxide gas and hydrogen gas. Determine how many liters of H2 gas measured at STP are produced when 49.8 liters of CH4 gas measured at STP are reacted. So we're trying to determine how many liters of H2 gas are produced when we start with 49.8 liters of CH4. Okay, this is another stoichiometry problem. So since it's a stoichiometry problem, and this is a time test, and we know that there are problems that can arise in stoichiometry problems, this would be one of the questions that we save until the end. So we're going to skip it and we come back. But I've got time right now, so I'm going to answer the question for you. We're starting with 49.8 liters of CH4. And at the end, we want to end up with liters of H2. Now, there's a nice little hint on our formula chart that gives us all sorts of fun hints for this. It says that the volume of an ideal gas at STP is 22.4 liters per mole. That's very important because we're going to need that conversion factor in just a minute. Okay, so we start with 49.8 liters of CH4. I need to know how many moles that is. So I'm going to go get rid of liters of CH4 and convert it to moles of CH4. Then I don't want moles of CH4 as my answer, so I'm going to get rid of it. I put moles of CH4 on bottom, and I want to get into H2, so I'm going to do moles of H2. Now, I don't want moles of H2 anymore, so I'm going to put moles H2 on bottom, and I'm going to put liters of H2 on top. Okay, so there were 22.4 liters for every one mole. Got that from the formula chart. There are three moles of H2 for every one mole of CH4. And then again, since this is STP, we get 22.4 liters for every one mole of H2. So conveniently, the 22.4s cancel out. I got one on top and one on bottom. They cancel. I had moles CH4 on bottom, moles CH4 on top. They cancel. Liters CH4 cancels with liters CH4. Moles of H2 cancels with moles of H2. So what I need to do now is just multiply straight across on the top. 49.8 times 3. Put that into my handy dandy calculator. And I get 149.4, which is D. Now, I just noticed this, but the unit that they gave us is wrong. They're talking about moles of NH3. So that one... If you're just looking at the units, you're going to have a severe problem. I hope they fix this test if they give it to anyone for real. 
go on to 28. The image below displays an example of what type of matter. Okay, I know that on the test that you got, this was a little bit blurry. But you could see that there were obviously some different things going on. So if it's not the same throughout, it is not an element. Okay? Homogeneous mixtures also look the same. We see different things all throughout. It's not a homogeneous mixture. Compounds have the same exact formula all the way throughout. If it's a compound, it looks exactly the same. Can't be a compound. We're left with one thing left. It's heterogeneous mixture, which means that it looks different from one place to the next. D is our answer. All right, next one. Radium-226 decays into radon-222. Which type of radioactive decay must have taken place? All right, so we're going to start with radium. And I don't know what radium is off the top of my head, so i got to go to my formula chart. And it is Ra. This is radium-226, so I put its mass, 226, on top. And on bottom, I am going to put its atomic number, which is 88. Okay? And it says that it decays into radon, 222. Two, two. So 222 two, two on top, Rn on bottom, and radon is number 86. Okay, so we have to balance out what our unknown particle is. So we have to say 226 minus what number is equal to 222, and we find that is 4. And 88 minus what number is 86, and that is 2. Now this 4,2 is helium, which is also, we get 4,2 alpha. It's an alpha particle, which is C. That's our answer. Quick and painless. Okay. Go on to the next one. It says a balloon filled with 0 0.02 moles of gas has a volume of 0.48 liters. Some of the gas is removed from the balloon, giving the balloon a new volume of 0.24 liters. How many moles of gas are left in the balloon, assuming pressure and temperature are being held constant? Round your answer to the hundredths place. So we have 0 0.02 moles of gas. And it has a volume of 0.24 or 0.48 liters initially. The next volume is going to be 0.24 liter. It says how many moles are left. That means N2 is an unknown. So I got to figure out what equation I'm going to use. Which one has volume and the number of moles in it? I go to my formula chart. I look for the only thing that has initial moles, final volume, initial volume, final moles, and it's going to be what we know as the combined gas law. It's P1, V1 over N1, T1 is equal to P2, V2 over N2, T2. Okay, it says that pressure and temperature are held constant. That means pressure and temperature fall right out of the equation, and it goes down to V1 over N1 is equal to V2 over N2. Now we just have to plug in. We have 0.48 over 0.02 and that needs to equal 0.24 over N2. This is everyone's favorite part. Cross multiply and divide. We get 0.48 N2 is equal to 0.02 times 0.24, we get 0 0.0048. Divide by 0.48, and you get 0 0.01. Now, the answer said rounded to the hundredths place, which means that it should have just that one. I shouldn't have any zeros or anything else like that afterwards. So zero, one, point. 
you can throw a zero in at the front and it won't mess it up. 0 0.01. Go to 31. Potential energy is a form of energy that is. Okay. Potential energy is a stored energy. We know that. It's the potential. It's like you all have the potential to be great, but if you never let that out, it never goes anywhere. So it can't be released due to physical position of, it or chem of chemical composition. It's potential. It's being stored. Stored due to physical position or chemical composition. That seems like it's a maybe. Due to random movement of particles. We're talking about movement. That's kinetic energy, so that's not going to work. And it says unable to be converted to kinetic energy. Well, just like your potential, if you start working with it, you can convert it into actual things that you can do. Just like potential energy, if I put a book at the top of a shelf, it has a lot of potential. It can fall and create a lot of kinetic energy. So that one has to be B. All right. Next up. Which of the following is an oxidation reduction reaction? So for an oxidation reduction reaction, it's a little confusing sometimes, but what we're looking for is a change in charges. So the first one we want to do is just label the charges. So magnesium has a charge of 2, bromine has a charge of negative 1, sodium's a 1, chlorine's a negative 1. This is all based on where they are on the periodic table, how far away they are from group 18. Magnesium is two away moving to the left, so it's positive two. Bromine is one away moving to the right, so it has a negative one charge. Sodium is one away to the left. Chlorine is one away to the right. And that's what we get. And then we look on the other side. This magnesium still has a charge of two. We can work backwards. This one's still two. This one's still one. Sodium is still one. Bromine is still one. Okay, so none of the charges change. They're all the same. So nothing was oxidized or reduced. This is just a double replacement. We can look at CO2 and H2 make CO and H2O. Now, if we're talking about charges and we want to look at charges changing, if CO2 is neutral and then CO is also neutral, something had to have changed. Electrons had to move, and that is the case. So when this H2 becomes H2O, the other way we can write H2O is HOH. This is negative, this is positive. This H2 itself is neutral. So we had a change from zero charge, zero charge, zero charge, to plus and minus. So that's a change of charges. This could be our answer. But let's go ahead and check through. The next one has H2, which H is a plus. There's two of them. It balances out the two minus from the SO4. This is a one. OH is a negative one. Na2 on the other side is still a one. SO4 is still a negative two. And then I have two NAs to balance it out. Two H2Os. The H never changed because it's still a plus and the OH is still a minus. This one's still plus, this one's still minus. E. It goes through the same exact process. The Na still stays as 1, PO4 still stays as 3, Mg2, SO4, 2, Mg2, PO4, 3. They crisscross Na2, plus 1, SO4, 2. B is our answer. Oh, finally, another easy one. Select the correct formula for carbon disulfide. So we have one carbon, and di means two, so CS2, D. That one's quick. Go on to the next one. 34, using the information provided in the table, determine the average atomic mass of the unknown element. All right, so all I need to do is change my percents into decimals and multiply. All right, 
So I'm going to put 0.9933 times the atomic mass, which is 14.0. Then I'm going to add 0, let's see, we have 0 0.0067 times 15.0. Then we're going to add 0 0.00. 0, 0, 1 times 16. You add them all up together. So put it in your calculator. You put in 0. 0.9933 times 14 plus 0. 0.0067 times 15 plus 0. 0. 0. 0.0001 times 16. And you get 14.00686, which is A. Go on to the next one. It says, while creating a piece of artwork, a student becomes curious about the ink he's using to create his art. He wonders if the ink is a pure substance or a mixture. The ink appears to be uniform throughout, but separates when a chromatography experiment is performed on it, leaving multiple marks of different colors along the chromatography paper. Using his observations of the properties of the ink, the student can classify it as, okay, a heterogeneous mixture would be something that throughout you would see different pieces. If you're using ink, ink looks the same everywhere it is. It's not going to be different. An element wouldn't separate. Chromatography is like putting something through a coffee filter. Things will separate out. However, if they're bonded together chemically, they're not going to separate out. So it can't be a compound. However, a solution has things suspended in it. If you filter the solution finely and very slowly, different parts of it will break it out into different pieces, and you get this as a solution. That's the answer for 35. All right, this is one of the fun ones. Number 36. H2 plus F2 makes 2HF, and we get a total heat of this. Okay, so that means HF, or 2HF, is equal to this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace that in the bottom equation, which if 2HF is that, 4 would be 2 times that. Okay? H2O, or 2H2O, is equal to this. So I'm going to replace that in the equation. I'm going to make this an equal sign, because the products on the left or the products on the right have to equal the reactants on the left. Okay, so 2H2O is negative 571.6. Now, I don't know exactly what 2F2 equals, and I don't know what O2 equals. But, since I told you that it has to equal no matter what, I can just put them on the other side of the equation. So I'm going to subtract O2 from each side. And I'm going to add 571.6 to both sides. So now I have 2F2 oh, minus O2 equals 2 times negative 546 plus 571.6. I'm going to put those numbers in my calculator to find out what I get. I get 2 times negative 546 plus 571.6. So that was 546.6. Sorry, I left a piece out. times negative 546.6 plus 571.6 and I get negative 521.6. So I need to fill in the negative 521.6 and my answer is rounded to the tenth place. If I don't round it to where they say, 
I end up getting the answer wrong. So that's 5, 2, 1, and 6. I know that's going to be a little bit confusing. We'll work on it more next week. Oh, another easy one. Identify the configuration of the valence electrons for the alkali metals. Alkali metals are in group one, which remember from what we did way at the beginning of the year, we've got these different blocks. Let's see, yeah. something like that on the periodic table. This is the S group. These over here are the P's. These are the D's and these are the F's. So the S in this first group are the alkali metals. And how many of the S's are they? Just one. The N represents what period? So it could be 1 S1, 2 S1, 3 S1, and so on. Our answer is C. Number 38. In 1909, Ernest Rutherford designed an experiment which he shot alpha particles at gold foil. His observations did not match his predictions, which were based on the plum pudding model. Instead, what did he actually observe during his experiment? Well, you got to remember, he shot these alpha particles straight forward, expecting them to go right through the foil. But, like we said when we went over this, they bounced right back at him. He said it was like throwing a heavy weight at some tissue paper and instead of it going through the paper it flew back at you. So that would have to be C. All of the alpha, oh, sorry, not all. Most of the alpha particles went straight through the foil and a few bounced backward off the foil. Now that's because atoms are, again, mostly empty space, but they are not completely empty. So it would never be in all of the alpha particles. Answer is D. All right, 39, which is a physical change. Remember, physical changes are changes that can be observed without changing the chemical composition of the substance. Okay? So if I change color, that shows me a chemical change. It means that A cannot be the answer. If I melt ice to give water, my chemical is still water. Looks like this is probably going to be it, but I'm going to check anyway. Uh, let's see, adding water to iron forms rust, that's a chemical word. Burning wood, that's a chemical word. The answer has to be B. Forty, when aqueous solutions of sodium hydroxide and copper two chloride react, what substances will precipitate? So precipitate means what things are going to come out as a solid. So which one of these two things is going to be solid? What we can do is look at our solubility chart. A solu something that's soluble would still be inside the aqueous solution. Something that is insoluble would come out as a solid. So we open up our formula chart. We go down until we get to solubility. And we have two compounds. One of them contains an alkali metal. As we know, anything that contains an alkali metal is soluble. That's what you can see in all of these exceptions. Alkali metal cations, alkali metal cations, alkali metal cations, alkali metal cations, alkali metal cations. If it's got an alkali metal, it's going to be soluble. So the thing that's soluble is this, the NaCl. So this should be our precipitate. And let's check real quick. It has an OH. It's insoluble, except for compounds with alkali metals, calcium, strontium, or barium. What is the OH bonded to? It's bonded to copper. That's none of those. So the answer is going to be D. Number 41. 950 grams of water in a calorimeter changes temperatures by 11.3 degrees Celsius when one gram of diesel is burned. What is the heat of combustion of one gram of diesel in kilojoules? Remember that the specific heat of water is 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. Now, the important thing is they asked for kilojoules, but inside the problem, they're giving you joules. It means we're going to have to do a conversion on our answer. This is a basic heat problem. Q is equal to mc 
delta t. They gave us m, which is 950 grams of water. They gave us c, which is 4.18. And then they gave us delta T, which is 11.3. So we're going to multiply those three together. We get 950 times 4.18 times 11.3, and that is 44872.3 joules of energy. Now, the heat equation says that the heat that you get in has to equal the heat that you lose. Okay, so that means that since the water gained that, that's the heat that you've combusted of the diesel fuel. So all I really need to do now is make sure that I have this in kilojoules. So kilojoules would be, there's a thousand of them for every joule, so I'm going to move this one, two, three, that's a thousand. And let's see if there's anything else. It says, round your answer to the tenth. That's the important part right there. That's what I was looking for. So we have 44.87, so I'm looking at my tenth spot, this eight right here. The number next to it is a seven, so I'm going to round up to 44.9 kilojoules. It also says, remember that combustion is exothermic. Exo means it's energy that is leaving. If you're losing something, that's a negative. So we need to make sure to fill in the negative. And 44.9. That one really wasn't that hard. It just seemed like it was. Move on to the next one, 42. Apply what you know about ionization energy to choose the one element which has the highest observed ionization energy among the following elements. So we go back to the old question, what is the trend for ionization energy? That trend should be up and right for increasing. So we take out our handy dandy formula chart, look at fluorine, look at chlorine, look at potassium, and look at vanadium. All right, so all the way to the up and right is fluorine. Now remember, electro or ionization energy is how much energy it's going to take to rip an electron off or form an ion. If I if I am really close to getting my eight electrons around me, it's going to be really difficult to pull an electron off. That's why fluorine holds on so tight. Okay, 43. A 21.7 gram sample of an unknown substance gains 1855 joules of energy when it's heated from 20.2 degrees Celsius to 204.5 degrees Celsius. What is the specific heat of the substance? This is another heat problem. Q equals mc delta t. Or as your formula put, chart puts it, it could be Q is equal to mc times t final minus t initial. Okay, so I just have 1855 for my Q is equal to m, which was 21.7 gram times C, which is our unknown, times my final temperature, which is 204.5, minus my initial temperature, which was 22. All I have to do is solve for C. So I'm going to divide by 21.7 times 204.5 minus 20.2 in parentheses. Because that's both of those things are multiplying by C. I'm going to put it in my calculator exactly the way I have it here. So I'm going to put 1855 divided by, and I'm going to open up a parenthesis to make sure I don't lose anything. It's 21.7. Open up another parenthesis to 04.5 minus 20.2. Close both of those parentheses, and I get 0.4638. 
which is a lot like 0.464, which is C. Go on to 44. Using standard enthalpies of formation, find the standard enthalpy of the reaction below. Round your answer to the tenth place. Use the griddle to enter your answers. All right. This is going to be really fun right here. We have carbon monoxide is negative 110.5. So I put negative 110.5. Actually, I'm going to go through and write the equation first. It's on our formula chart. If we go down to the bottom of the formula chart, on the front page, I gotta put the marker down. It says enthalpy of a reaction, enthalpy of products minus enthalpy of reactants. So, I go back into my test. My enthalpy of my products is going to be the CO2 and the H2. Those ones come first. So CO2 is negative 393.5 plus H2 is zero. Now I have to subtract my reactant. So CO, carbon monoxide, was negative 110.5. I mean to close the parentheses yet. 10.5 plus H2O, which is 241.8, but it's a negative as well. And I throw these in my calculator just as I've written them. So I have negative 393.5 minus, open parentheses, negative 110. 0.5 plus a negative 241.8 and I get negative 41.2 so I need to make sure to fill in my negative and then 41.2 now it does say round your answer to the tenths place and I'm going to say 41.2 that goes to the tenths very good go on to number 45 a scientist is testing an unknown sample of matter to find its identity. He attempts to distill the uniform sample but finds it to be inseparable. Next, he begins to experiment with the reactivity of the sample and finds that under no circumstances will the sample decompose into simpler substances. What category of matter does this sample most likely fall under? Well, if it is absolutely inseparable, well, it's got to be an element. It's got to be A. That one's pretty easy. Go to the next one. Given the reactions, XS is one half O2, XOS, XCO3, XOS, CO2, blah, blah, blah. Select the court delta H of the reaction and type of reaction. All right. So we got to figure out basically what this XCO3 is all about, which shouldn't be all that difficult. <clears throat> Gonna take a break for a second though. Alright, I got some water, now I'm back. Alright, what we need to do is add things up. So this XOS is the same thing as this piece over here. Negative 577.7. So if I look here, that's this. Negative 577.7. The CO2 is going to stay as CO2. And XCO3 is right here. It equals 228.1. Okay, so we're going to put everything on one side, all the numbers on one side again, and we'll get negative 805.8. So 577.8. 0.7 minus 228.1 equals negative 805. Because I didn't really spell that out too well. And we move on to the next one. These ones are a little bit confusing, but there's only four or five of them on the whole test. 
we can make things easier. Number 47, identical amounts of water and potassium bromide are mixed in four different ways. In which case will the potassium bromide dissolve fastest? Remember, heat it, stir it, crush it. That's how we make things dissolve quickly. So hot water, B and C is heating it. No stirring, large or powdered, so crush it. C has heat it and crush it. That's our answer. 48. The quantity of an element in grams equal to the atomic mass of the element represents how many moles of the element? So if I have 1.008 grams of hydrogen, that should remind us that this is the molar mass or the grams per one mole. The answer is C. Okay, 49. By the blank definition, an acid is a substance that, when dissolved in water, increases the concentration of hydrogen ion or H plus aqueous. A base is a substance that, when added to water, increases the concentration of the trihydroxide ion. All right, so when we were talking about acids and bases, we had three definitions. There's the Arrhenius, the Bronsted-Lowry, and the Lewis. Now, the Arrhenius is the most general. That's the one that just said that if there's more H+, plus, there's an acid. If it's more OH-, minus, it's a base. Brunstead-Lowry said things about uh, hydrogen, or not hydrogen ion, but uh, electron donor or hydrogen ion donor, hydroxide ion donor, things like that. Got a little bit more specific. Lewis was the one that said that you had electron pair donor, or electron pair receiver. So the one that we're looking for is the most general. This is the Arrhenius acid. It's also the one that's the easiest to figure out most of the time. Well, because you can just imagine if it has starts with an H, it's an acid. If it has an OH in it, it's a base. 50, which of the following statements about frequency and wavelength is true? OK. So I guess I need to explain what waves are. So we have a wave. Okay. So this is one cycle of a wave. It goes from here, it goes up and down and back to where it started. That's a cycle. The wavelength goes from here to here. This is wavelength. Okay. Frequency is telling you how quickly you go through these cycles. So if we're talking about frequency, something with a low frequency would take a long time to go through your cycle. Something with a high frequency would go very quickly. It's frequent. You see it happen several times in a short period of time. So. If frequency increases, the wavelength decreases. Did we see that? No. Or did we? If frequency increases. My wavelength, the distance from here to here, decreases. So I guess that is true. The answer should be A. Frequency and wavelength are related. C says, if frequency decreases, wavelength decreases. So that's opposite of what we saw. And then it says, if frequency increases, wavelength increases. And that's the same thing as what C is saying. So A is the answer. And we're almost done. Two more questions. Oh, nice easy one. What is the correct name for the compound with barium and hydroxide in it? It's going to be C, barium hydroxide. And finally, select the ion with the largest radius. And remember, radius increases as you move down in a group. So the largest ion is going to come from rubidium. That's it. Have a nice day.